Uh, I am a 50-year-old black man from the Arkansas Delta. I call everybody baby. It keeps me from misgendering people. It also means I am grumpy most of the time. And I did not have a nap today. What we're going to do comes out of the work of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement called Militant Nonviolent Civil Disobedience. Could you say that? Militant? You sound like a raggedy drunk choir. Let's do it again. <laughs> Which is not passive. It is about a direct confrontation with the state. So more drama to prick the conscience of the state to create change. So it is to militant nonviolent civil disobedience is about creating a more creating a more for the purposes of pricking the conscience of the to create and now we do this work out of deep abiding love. Say deep abiding love. Deep abiding love. Which is different than when you first meet somebody and you think they cute. <laughs> this is about uh, willing to commit yourself to a story bigger than yourself and older than yourself. It's willing, willingness to put your body on the line and take risk. The first rule of nonviolence is the preservation of life. Say preservation of life. Preservation of life. Second rule of nonviolence is to live the fight another day. Say live the fight another day. Live the fight another day. What's the first rule of nonviolence? Preservation of life. Second rule of nonviolence. Live the fight another day. There are two ways in which you can uh, 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 respond in an action, right? So when people come to protest, they come like uh, some folks like they just want to come support. Right. They don't want to go to jail for a variety of reasons. And if you want to uh, uh, you want to come uh, for a variety of reasons. And so you can respond to two kinds of cues, verbal cues and physical cues. Say that. Say verbal, verbal. and physical. So, meaning that if the police ask you to do something, like they say move with a verbal, right, you, and, you're gonna, and you've agreed as a group that some of all of you all are going to respond to verbal cues, you'll respond to a verbal cue, right? So we're going to try that now. So I'm the police, and I tell you to move, and you're just going to take a step back. Move! That's a verbal cue, right? You can make a decision to do that. You can only respond to physical cues, meaning they touch you, right? Or push you with a shield or something, right? So we're going to try responding to physical cue. Move. That was verbal. Move. Physical cue. Right? Those are your options. I see we have a badass over here who didn't move for verbal or physical cues. <laughs> they going to be a problem. <laughs> right? So you can respond, but you're right. We, we, do, we do not respond to verbal or physical cues. We do non-engagement and non-compliance. Say non-engagement. And non-compliance. Non-compliance. We y'all we act like they ain't there. We act like they ain't there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and we don't do what they tell us to do. Right? Right, so non-engagement non and non-compliance. Non but you still don't have the option to respond to what kind of cue? Verbal and physical. What's the first rule of nonviolence? Second rule of nonviolence. And what are we doing? <laughs> Which is passive. It is about a direct confrontation to create a more. 
To prick the conscience of the? Change. For the purposes of? Change. Now, because of y'all a bunch of commies who hate America, uh, with the gay agenda, and you violent, all of you, that's what they say on the news about you. I heard about you. And we can trust the news. I read it on the internet. So now, cause y'all a bunch of violent people who hate America and trying to make everybody a homosexual and you're violent, they're trained to deal with you as violent. But they don't know what to do with joy. They don't know what to do with uh, levity. So when we were in Ferguson, we jumped over a fence that uh, uh, they didn't put around the federal building because evidently a bunch of clergy in robes are dangerous. <laughs> and so, I can see that the tasers are hot. And I say to the, I go find the medics and I say, look here, I'm about to jump over this fence and I got an old bad heart. So if they hit me with that taser, I might lay down. So I just need you next to me to wake me up. And if you are calling an action you never ask people to do something you are not willing to do. So I said, I'm going to go first. So I went, and then some other folks came along, and, and so Homeland Security lines up in front of us, and so we sit. So sit. So because I'm a man, and I'm big and strong, and I like patriarchy. I'm gonna confront the patriarchy with my patriarchy. That always goes well. <laughs> so Lisa, how many of you all know the name Lisa Fithian? Yeah. yeah. Lisa's a Jedi in this movement. Yes, and so I say, I lean, I look over to Lisa. I said, Lisa, we need to stand up and confront them. And Lisa says, no, scoot. She says, scoot. I said, huh? She says, scoot. So just scoot. Just scoot forward. <laughs> Scared the shit out of Homeland Community. Because, <laughs> right, they didn't know what to do with that. Right? Because they was ready for a bunch of angry, homosexual commies who hate America. Now, we was all of that, <laughs> but we was just scooting, <laughs> right? So figure out ways to do levity and to have joy. There are three abiding principles for me in this work. Deep abiding love. Say deep abiding love. Deep abiding love. Say subversive joy. Subversive joy. And revolutionary grace. Right? Because part of it is, uh, I always tell young activists, you know, I'm an old black man from the South. I'm probably going to say something fucked up. I mean, not intentionally, you know, but because I'm in community with younger activists who say, Rev, you can't say that. You can't do that. Right? This is why that is problematic. But because I'm in community with them, they can call me in and they can extend me grace. And so my prayer for you is that you will extend each other grace, even when you fuck up. Because the empire shames. Right, that's what the empire does. It shames, it mocks, it makes you feel insecure because you didn't do or say the right thing. And we don't want to reproduce that in our movement. 
We want to extend, and I'm not saying if, you know, subjugate yourself to harm or no shit like that. It might not be your ministry to be graceful. So you just get yourself out the way. And then, and then the other thing is, there's other shit you can do. You don't have to be on the front lines. I think everybody should suck up a little tear gas since they're giving it out so freely. I think there's something about going and experiencing that that is important. But there's a woman named Ruby Doris Wilson, and they had whooped them on that bridge in Selma. And they came in and they bleeding, and the doctor said, Ruby, I tell them that they don't, y'all don't look sick to me. So Ruby stuck her finger down her throat up and threw, and, and threw up on the doctor's shoes. She said, is that sick enough for you, motherfucker? Then they was on another march and a, a, a state trooper pulled a rifle out and put it in Ruby's face. She snatched the rifle out of his hand and pointed it back at him and said, now what you gonna do, motherfucker? And they say, Ruby, you can't come to the protest no more. <laughs> but we gonna put you over the money. Cause we know ain't nobody gonna fuck with you. So there's a role for everybody, right? And during the Vietnam Revolution, the sex workers were organizing. Because the soldiers like to talk, doing pillow talk. Right, there's a role for everybody. So you can make sandwiches for the babies when they come out of jail. If you got some power or privilege and you're in an organization that know a judge or know somebody, with, uh, they got a little power, you can call on them and say, leave them babies alone. Right? There's a role for everybody. And then when you don't even understand what they're doing in the streets, you still extend them grace. Cause, and I often say this to elders about uh, queer f kids. Comprehension is not a prerequisite to compassion. To be honest, most of that shit they did in the streets in Ferguson I thought was dumb. They had this old dumb ass chant. We young, we strong, we marching all night long. I'd be like, it's two goddamn AM. We been out here all night and I hadn't had a nap. But even if I didn't understand it when I got on TV, I'd lie. This is the greatest generation we've ever seen. I cussed them out on my dinner table because we were in relationship. But what I'm saying, I want you to extend young people and young organizers grace. And even when you don't understand it, extend them compassion. Because all of us, part of our own personal narrative is that somebody loved us in spite of ourselves. Right? I think that's what they call marriage. I've done it twice, so I'm an expert. Now, won't you lock arms for me? Now there are a couple ways. What's the first rule of nonviolence? Preservation of life. And the second rule? Live to fight another day. So what we've seen is that they'll take a baton and stick it under your arm and pull it, right? And that'll dislocate your shoulder. So if they take the baton, stick it under your arm and pull it, what you gonna do? You're going to let go. Let go. Right? Because what's that second rule? Because And don't nobody want to be setting no broke shoulder and I'm easily grossed out. Now, how many of you have ever been uh, pepper sprayed or tear gas? It's just tacky, ain't it? Now, when the tear gas come out, drop your head. All right? And then when you've been tear gas, who are you going to, what you going to do next? Say it. Say it. They calling you, Woody. Uh, you'll know the difference. The, pep the pepper spray is going to be, it's going to be close range. They're going to pull it out, spray it in your face. Tear gas is usually shot from far off. You can and do a canister, and you use it in here and come. It'll go. Right? Anybody remember the old bank? When you sign your check and you put it in the old bank shoe? That sound. It makes that sound. 
Now, if you hear a gun, when we were in Charlottesville, we called in a woman named Sarah Naha to meet a leading nonviolent theoretician in the world uh, because I had never done, dealt with armed actors before besides the state. So if you hear a gunshot, you are to get low, zigzag, and get to a place that you can shelter in place, which are behind here, that tree, that tent, and there. When you go to an action, if you're going calling an action, you need to have walked that site three times at least, particularly in cities, construction happens. So things get obscured overnight. Like that wasn't here the last time we were here, uh, two days ago, right? You need to make a habit. When you walk in, you need to build this habit in. Where you walk into a building, you know where the exits are. You know where the cameras are. You have a sense of the security rotation in that building, right? You do it out of habit. Till it becomes second nature. You make a habit of scanning the top of buildings. Like for instance, if you are in a restaurant, there's always going to be a back exit through what? Kitchen. Which is typically going to go into a? Right? That's what I mean. So you want to build a habit, and like a, 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 just a, a natural, instinctive security culture. And so if a gunshot goes off, you get low, get low, right? Good, you can get up now. And because you have scouted the place that you are protesting, you already know where the shelter places are. Point to me the nearest shelter in place for you. All right? And you make a habit of that. So what do you do when you hear a gunshot? And you run in a straight line. No. Bang! <laughs> this is an unlawful assembly. Please disperse immediately, or you will be subject to arrest and or other actions. The and or other actions always fucked me up. Right, that's like, you, you know, I, I had an old school, my grandmama raised me. And when it's like that threat, like don't make me come in there. You know what I mean? And or other actions. Right, so lock arms. Move. When I say shields, I want you down. And then scoot, all right? Shields. Scoot. So when I say shield, you go down and then you scoop up. Shields. As soon as you go down, you start scooting. Up. Shields. Beating. Pepper spray. Tear gas. All right. Yes. Scoot is a way to push them back. And it usually freaks them out. And we are creating a moral to prick the conscience of the state. You don't know if the. It's a Pascalian wager. To create militant nonviolence 
civil disobedience is passive. First rule of nonviolence. Second rule of nonviolence. You touch your junk after you've been pepper sprayed. You wear contacts to the protest. You wear patchouli to the protest. You ever wear patchouli. <laughs> Do you wear oil based things? No. Do you wear contacts? No. Do you wear makeup? No. Do you wear your fancy dangling earrings? No. Do you talk to the police? No. There are four questions that you need to ask when you have been arrested, or well, four statements. Am I being detained? I would like to speak to my lawyer. I am exercising my right to remain silent. I do not consent to a search. Am I being detained? I would like to speak to my lawyer. I'm exercising my right to remain silent. I do not consent to a search. So the police, they arrest you, they being nice to you. That show sure is a pretty dress you got on. Are you an Aquarius? What's your birthday? And why shouldn't you tell them your birthday? Also, most of y'all, that's your goddamn code to your phones. <laughs> so, you put your, a lock on your phone and you take off facial recognition. Shouldn't probably have that on there anyway. Yes. No, don't do thumb, none of it. Nothing other than you punching the code in that can open your phone, okay? So you don't talk to them. And there's a phone number you should have written on your body. 206. Okay. Try me. 206. Okay. Try me. Where well, are you going to write it? So on your arm or on your stomach? It's, to my understanding, they've been scrubbing it off people's arms. Uh, oppression is a lot of work. I just don't understand why they do all of that. You know what I mean? It would just be so much not, you know, just don't be an asshole. It's real, you know what I mean? Like, just don't do that. Anyway, we do this work because we hate the police. Why do we do it? We can strongly dislike them. Have great disdain. Like I do for Justin Bieber. And trying to get white folks to clap on two and four. Don't really understand it. So we do this work out of what? And the three guiding principles of militant nonviolence are deep abiding love, subversive joy, and revolutionary grace. Part of civil disobedience is slowing up the system, right? So we do non-engagement and Set. Non non so, I, how many got toddlers in their life? <laughs> but you remember being around a toddler? This is a skill of civil disobedience that they have mastered. It's called going limp. Right? So when you go limp, lay back. Lay back, everybody lay back. Put, pull your shoulders up and your head down. 
And why is that? Protect your neck. That's right. And then let and then they're gonna pull you. Right? And it's gonna take one or two of them to pull you, right? So it's gonna slow it down. Alright? Up. So no, I mean you can stay stay sitting. So arrest. What do you do? Arrest. Back. Am I being Right? But after right, like right, but what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna go limp. And then what are the questions? I want to speak to my lawyer. I'm, I'm exercising my right to remain silent. I do not consent to assert. So do you understand why I'm running this like drills this way? Yes. I needed to get in your bones and become instinctive to you. That's why we want you to come to as many of these trainings as possible. To get it in your bones. Beating. Pepper spray, tear gas, beating, pepper spray, tear gas, beating, pepper spray, tear gas, arrest. What are we doing? First rule of nonviolence. Second rule of nonviolence. Militant nonviolence is passive. It's about creating a moral to prick the conscience of the for the purposes of change. You touch your junk when you've been pepper sprayed. You wear patchouli to the march. You wear makeup to the march. You wear earrings. You talk to the police. No. We do this work out of what? Three guiding principles of militant nonviolent civil disobedience are. So are any of you doing this because you want more power? I mean, we're, we're taught to believe that power is a negative thing, right? We are. But what is power? How is power defined? Right, the ability to act. Nothing more, nothing less. But what we see is that there are certain people that we believe have power who are not exercising it in the way that we would want. So I actually think that when we talk about the roots, the primary thing we have to understand that is the dynamics of power that are underlying everything that we're actually dealing with. And again, in my, you know, ha, you know and I just want to say, you know, there's no such thing as original idea. I'm just one of many channels that's trying to share with you things that I've learned from people before me. And I've also begun to realize more and more that each movement brings a certain wisdom to the fore and that there are times where a lot is coming through. And I really believe that right now is a time where a lot of wisdom is coming through to all of us. And I'm just one of many channels trying to bring it forward. But I do, you know, I've always felt like a lot of my work is helping people reclaim their power. But as some of you all said, there's different types of power, right? There's the power you know, and again, I'm not the creator of this, this concept of power over, which is the power of the dominant culture, which is that power where we all believe that we are supposed to be what somebody else wants us to be, our parents, the teachers, the pastors, the doctors, whatever. So we're living a lot of our lives trying to be something that we may not be. There's power with which is what we're building, that collective power, right? It's my belief, it's that power of the horizontal networks, the same kind of networks we use to shut down the, the WTO. There's power within. Every single one of us has power to change the world. That's that life force, that sacred force. And it's that that is the force that they try so hard to kill. And there's power under. 
And that's really where we generally live. I got a bunch of people arrested once, and it was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I went into the 7-Eleven to, to pee. I said, can I use the bathroom? And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am. There's no public restroom. I said, I didn't ask if there was a public restroom. I asked if I could use the bathroom right there. And he said, sorry, ma'am, you can't. I said, wait a minute. Let's be clear. I could, but you're afraid of what your boss will say at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they're not even here. He's like, you're right. Use the bathroom. <laughs> but as I look at that, that story even more, I think to myself, why did I even ask? So I really learned to just pay attention to myself, that whenever I say I can't do something, it's really because I'm afraid of something that might happen. So when we understand that power is relational, it's this dance. It's the dance in the streets when people are rising up in their own power that's contesting the reality of our conditions. Because I think a lot of what we're doing is trying to change the conditions in which we live. So when I think about the building blocks of change, the very first thing I think about is understanding these dynamics of power. Because they're playing out around us all the time. And if we're not cognizant of how they are operating, we're going to miss a big part of how we need to be organizing. And those power over, power with, power within, and power under. So as I continued on my work of organizing, I, um, I was born in the south in Georgia. I was raised in the north. And I always knew at some level in my body that racism was doing harm. I didn't really fully understand it as a kid, but I knew something wasn't right. But as I got older and started to learn more and more about this, because every single movement that I've ever been involved in, I've seen torn apart by racism. And so I made a decision that I was going to work on racism for a while. And in my home community of Austin, we began doing these trainings called Undoing Racism by the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And PSAB has had a huge impact here in Seattle. Many trainers here, it's impacted the city government, and we took some lessons from Seattle, and we continued to organize in Austin. And I'll tell you something, we are seeing radical change. And a lot of what that radical change is, is that those of us, no matter what our age, what our race, what our gender, are having a common analysis, a common language, a common understanding of history, so that when we talk and strategize, we're meeting each other. Because right now, if I was to ask every single one of you in this room to define racism, I bet you I would get a different definition from all of you. There might be some similarities. But as long as we are not understanding what this dynamic of power is, we're going to miss each other. So back to the roots. This is a, an image that was put together by Rupa Marya, who was working with the Close the Camps uh, in San Francisco's Extinction Rebellion group. And we know, particularly those of you that are on this land, understand the legacy of colonization. You know, when we were becoming two-legged, we started getting wired in a certain way. And at some point, we, we created something called civilization. And it was during that era of civilization that humans separated ourselves from nature. That was the first level of separation. We know in the uh, cosmology of Christianity was another level of separation between Adam and Eve. We know from the founding of so many of these settler colonial states that those with wealth were separated from those without wealth. 
And all of these forms of separation or supremacy have led to nothing, and capitalism as well, have led to trauma, nothing but trauma. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I truly believe that as we go forward into a new decade, right, because we are on the verge of a new decade and change happens in cycles and you can see patterns over decades, that we have to figure out how to be radically different. And yes, we need to like organize, we need to take creative action, we need to shut sh down, we need to do all that stuff. But if we don't deal with this, and if we don't deal with the healing of the trauma that is created, we are going to continue to perpetuate all of this and our movements will continue to be divided. And this for me is one of the most important lessons and wisdom coming through for new movements that are starting, particularly Extinction Rebellion. Because white supremacy, all supremacies, teach us about, you know, we have this one way, it's my way, it's the right way, we have to take action, action, we have to do all this stuff. And we can roll over people and histories. And if we do that now, we're not gonna create anything new. Which is partially why also Extinction Rebellion in the US, which I'm so proud of, has created that fourth demand. Because we recognize that, yes, we need a transition. But if the transition isn't rooted in justice and the rights of Mother Nature and reparations, we may get to a more sustainable world and people will still be getting screwed. We can't keep doing that. So one of the things that we're gifted with from the wisdom is an understanding of trauma and how it works in our neurology. I bet you guys didn't come here thinking you were going to learn about trauma, did you? <laughs> well, if you're going to do direct action and face the state and face the fear that it brings upon us and the harm and the fact that they will kill us, we've got to deal with the trauma in order to stay in the streets and to be resilient. So part of the neurology uh, that they've learned is that there are different states of regulations. So, so back to, you know, when we started to become human, we got wired biologically to know that we had to stay with the clan or the tribe community. Otherwise, if we were cast out, we would die. So we were socialized and wired to be together. And we got that fight-flight system. And that helped us survive. Part of the problem and part of the tricks about trauma is that it gets us locked in to that fight or flight. And the fears that we once faced are not the same fears today. Now, if you're an indigenous person, a black person, a Latinx person, a trans person, a poor person, your life could be threatened any day. But for those of us that are white, we've been socialized to believe in a lot of irrational fears that drive us to do stupid things. And part of that, that neurology is, and the trauma that we're all carrying is that it tends to either put us in a state of hyper-regulation where we're like anxious, angry, agitated, acting out, does anybody ever go there? Or hypo-regulated, lethargic, apathetic, don't want to get out of bed, powerless. Anybody ever go there? And what happens to us living in this culture of power over is that we're ping-ponging a lot between these places. And it's exhausting. And part of what is also happening is that, again, knowing that we were wired 
to be interdependent. We've been socialized by all those oppressive systems, those ideologies, those beliefs, and they're all about distancing and othering and separation. Is it any wonder that we're so screwed up? Have any of you been living with this place of discontent inside, not feeling completely whole, happy, powerful, centered, and grounded? Does anybody feel that? It's because we got set up. Because we're wired to be one way, we're socialized to be another way. But this is where we're trying to get to. So again, those spaces, and I created these new slides, so i am got to get catch up to myself. What are your strategies? When you're feeling dysregulated, that's language I'm learning to take for myself. It happened to me this morning on the panel. All of a sudden, I found myself going, whoa, right, and had to bring myself back. But what are your strategies for getting back to that calm, centered, grounded place? Anybody got any? Breathing. Okay. Deep breaths and hold it. Water on the face, that sacred element. Self-compassion. I didn't hear all of them. Painting banners, excellent, being creative. Going deeper into community, reconnecting with people. Yep, excellent, right? Reminding ourselves who we are, exactly. Well, it's interesting, because when I began to sort of understand these states of regulation, two things happened. One, I began to realize that all of this stuff is really essential to our organizing, right? We sort of know this, we've been doing it, but I understood it at a new level. Like if we can take, whenever we're bringing people together, and by the way, are you all, do you all consider yourselves organizers? Excellent, I see some people shaking their heads. So one of my mentors, Ron Chisholm from the People's Institute says, an organizer is anybody that brings two or more people together for a common purpose. Have you all done that? So you're all organizers. And that's, we have to understand that we all have to be organizers, right? Because that's a key to getting people in motion. When we are living in this culture of power over and death, it's a culture of death, let's just be clear, it's really hard sometimes for people to break through that. And so that's, again, where we have to help each other and take each other's hands and go together. So the more we're all organizing people in our family, in our community, right, the more quickly we may actually get people to another place. And then when we bring people together, can we start engaging in practices, ceremony, prayer, breathing, food sharing, getting to know each other, building those authentic relationships? Because White supremacy is a culture of transaction, always trying to get something from somebody else, right? We are trying to build a culture of transformation where that change internally and externally are moving us forward to something new. And when I started to look at this even more, I began to see patterns. Does anybody know what complexity science is? I said the word complexity science. You mean quantum physics and chaos theory? Yes, exactly. So we don't relate to that term, but it's actually an emergence of a new understanding of how to view the world and change. It's the study of organic living systems. And when I read this, my father gave me this book called Complexity Science, The Emerging Edge of Order and Chaos. And I was like, oh, chaos, let me learn about that. But I began to see that there's a science behind why nonviolent direct action networks work. And there's all kinds of principles from individual agents in a network situation and open environments where we're gathering information and where we're getting feedback, positive and negative, positive feedback, positive feedback moves us forward more, negative moves us back. There's no one strategy, multiple strategies, but there's a place called the edge of chaos. 
And it's that edge of chaos that is that moment, some people call it a tipping point, where something new can emerge. But what emerges, as we've said already today, is based on what's come before. So that means we have to start being really smart about how we're doing our work. Not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And the more we're doing our work in a ways that are bringing this, because I'll tell you something, we did a lot of amazing prefigurative work in the Battle of Seattle. The convergence space, the food, the medicine, the legal support, the art, you know, the singing, the puppets. It was amazing. And we were alive and we were free. But I don't think we really had figured out that trauma piece as well yet. So again, as I began to look at the pattern, because fractals is a repeating pattern that, you know, small replicable actions can lead to a great change in any system. But the pattern I began to see here is that state of hyperregulation actually corresponds to power over and supremacy. And that state of hypo-regulation corresponds to power under, which in the framework of the People's Institute, internalized racial oppression, their superiority and inferiority. You have to have one with the other. And so anybody that doesn't fit into the dominant mainstream will fall here. But this really corresponds to power under. But it's this space of power with and power within, which is really this space of liberation and this is where we start getting free. Because again, we know we've all been set up, we've all been effed up, we've all been harmed, we've all been traumatized. But the thing for those of us that are white, we don't understand how we've been made sick because we're so comfortable. But until we understand that we have skin in this game, and that those of us with the most power have the greatest obligation to relay that table, we're not going to be showing up as accomplices. We might be showing up as allies, the good people. But the problem is with allies even, when you think about being an ally, what are you really doing? I think you're exercising power over. As an ally? Yes. In what way? Um, because you're not doing it because you're in it with somebody. You're doing it because you think you're superior and you're doing something for somebody. Right. I also really don't agree that angry energy is supremacy. Because if you're queer or trans or poor or black or native or any number of things, it's a perfectly healthy response to be furious right now. So I disagree with that. I don't know about white people being angry, but I do know as a Jew, I'm really pretty angry right now. And I would challenge any non-Jew uh, to tell me that that's supremacy. That's I agree with you. I agree with you, actually. Because anger is a righteous force. I think what I would, and again, I'm learning. I think what I would say to this is that when we are being reactive in our anger, as opposed to intentionally acting out of it, is where it becomes into this, this place of oppression. Because that's part of the trick with, with trauma, is that we are, when we are reacting, we're not thinking. And those of you that train people for direct action, that's part of what we teach people to do, is to get grounded, get clear, be, know our attention, and to be making conscious choices because it's a conscious choice that's the exercise of our power. And so, um, point well taken, and I agree with you. Yep. Um, so, I don't, say what? I don't remember where I was talking about. Oh, but that's okay. Oh, ally. oh, the ally piece, right. Because so many of us who are trying to be allies, we come from this place of thinking like, well, we're good and we can do this and we're gonna show up to help. And it's for somebody else. And it's because it's what we think we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to be. But it doesn't actually come from a place of understanding that we're impacted too. And that our liberation is bound up with the liberation of others. 
And when we understand that, we're actually also going to be in a place where we're going to be willing to take more risks. Hand in the back. With the whole ally thing is allies often become part of what I like to call the white savior industrial complex. Right. And and in in in, in trying to make it about helping people, they're setting up a dynamic, right? And and it's really all about them and not the people that are, they're so far helping. And um, it, I see it all over the place in Seattle, you know, and it, it, it comes with so much self-righteousness. And to me, it also seems to also be a form of white supremacy. It absolutely is a form of white supremacy. And that's the thing about white supremacy and capitalism, that it's so adaptable. And it's so many layers of it, right? Which is why for those of us that are white, we have to understand that this is lifelong work of undoing. Because it is so easy, these systems snap us back in, it is so easy to continue to perpetuate it. And so again, as we think about building the world that we want, and the deep change that needs to happen, it's not just in the streets, but it's really inside. And then building those relationships in that place of health. Because without that foundation, we will continue to perpetuate harm and not even know that we're doing it. So um, I need to move on. You know, healing trauma, some of the, I've already talked about this. So I want to just go real quickly through some of the other, what I think are the building blocks of change. What are interests? Anybody know what interests are? Who's a community organizer here? Labor union organizer? What are interests? What's important to you? What's important to you? Something that benefits you. We all have interests. We have interests. The people we oppose have interests. When you know interests, that's part of what you know can start moving people. So interests are, you know, something that benefits, they change over time, but part of the art of strategic escalation and action is going through a process of making the interests of whoever we are fighting the interests of the state or the, our opposition, because that's when they, things turn. So often, generally speaking, I did this slide when I was doing labor people, often the people that we're opposing care about money, doing business, and image, right? More or less, simplistic. I like simple things, right? We often care about, well, again, I did this in a worker context. This needs to change because, yes, we fight for higher wages because we have these jobs, and I actually think that jobs are a big part of the problem. We don't need jobs. We need meaningful work, and we need our needs met. And that has been done. You know, there has been society before capitalism. There are still societies today that don't work in a capitalist model. So anyway, we, we need to have the resources we need. We need to be able to feel secure. We need to be able to be respect and have dignity and be treated well. So in this dynamic of how do we create change and changing interests, we need to understand that if they care about money, we need to cost them money. If they care about doing business, we have to disrupt it. And if we care about image, all right, I haven't updated this slide. Um, destroy is kind of a strong word. <laughs> Someone said it, expose, reveal. But this is the thing, this is the, the real deal. It's like, we are raised in a violent culture. Like, I consider myself a warrior, but I want to do no harm. But we are raised in a culture of violence. And if I was to ask you, what are some of the key dates that most people in this country would know? Wars. Right. They're all wars or violence. We don't tell the history of resistance and creativity and resilience. Right. So I just cut myself a little slack that sometimes I fall into that war language use. But I also know that there is, in fact, a war being waged on the planet and the people. We didn't create this war. But we have to decide if we're going to fight it, and then how are we going to fight it? Good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. 
So strategy, building blocks of change. Interest strategy, we need to know strategy. But I'll tell you something interesting to me. I grew up learning about strategic strategy, campaigns. Who is the person that has the power to decide? How do you move them? But we are in a new area of strategic change, and I'll get to that a little bit more. But so strategy is nothing more than a plan to win, and there's a set of questions. There's lots of strategic models out there that people can share with you. But ultimately, some of the biggest questions in any strategic or any organizing process is what is the problem? What is the solution? And what are you going to do? If you get those three things down, that will allow you to tell the story that needs to be told to compel people to keep moving. Because people don't move because of the problems. They bitch, they moan, they crevetch, complain. But when they feel like this, there is an alternative. When they see something and believe there's something else, they're much more likely to move. And so as organizers, our job is to not only be able to articulate the problem, but work with people to get a vision of the solution, and then work together to figure out what is our plan of action to change things. And in order to change things, let me just say this. This is also a strategic tool that's called the Pillars of Support. It comes out of Gene uh, Sharp's work. It's been used by people overthrowing governments around the world. You saw it in the Contestoria this morning, that part of the idea that people power is about chipping away at these institutions that support these systems of power over, and eventually that system will become destabilized and fall. 